Hello, hello, welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains getting better eventually, I hope. And today, we are going to discuss several locomotives that had a really bad start. Just awful, terrible. They could easily have appeared on my worst trains ever list. But they got better through a variety of changes and alterations and even some rebuilds. They actually turned out to be exceptional locomotives because they were given a second chance. These are five trains that were failures but later became successes. The Atlantic Coastline Class R1. These locomotives were a set of 12 484 Northern types that were built by Baldwin in 1938, specifically for the Atlantic Coastline Railroad. They operated until the early 1950s, and they were meant initially for fast passenger service. They were large and powerful, and they were capable of very fast speeds. But Atlantic was extremely disappointed with them initially, because Frankly, they were terrible. They had very poor counterbalancing, and when delivered, they had a bad dynamic augment. This caused the main drivers of the locomotive to actually leave the rails on occasion and slam back down. This damaged the rails, of course, misaligning them and kinking them, requiring repair, which is expensive. And I put them low on the list because, to be honest, even after fixes, they still kind of had this problem. They were better, but they would still occasionally do that. They just hated the rails they ran on and saw fit to destroy them. But fortunately, Atlantic still had a use for them. The balancing problem usually only cropped up at the high speeds, and they were also very capable pullers with excellent tractive effort. That meant that they were actually exceptional for slow freight service as well. Their problems were also further remedied by Timken, who gave them very lightweight piston rods, crossheads, and tapered main rods with roller-bearing wrist pins. This restricted their hammer blow to an absolute minimum, limiting the issue of balance as much as it really could be without a complete rebuild of their workings. With all these fixes, like I said, they did actually serve for a decent amount of time, but of course couldn't escape the ever-encroaching dieselization of America's rail lines. Not a single R1 wound up preserved, and they were all scrapped by 1952. Their tenders, eight of them, actually lasted with Norfolk and Western until 1958, but they also would be scrapped. The North British Atlantic Class H, which are also known as the London and Northeastern Railway Class C11, as they were redesignated when the grouping happened. Just wanted to clear that up. Because some people don't realize that LNER actually renamed a ton of NBR stuff. But they're literally the same group of locomotives. 22 of them, to be precise. And they were 442 Atlantics. And they were the heaviest, longest, and most powerful, by tractive effort anyway, locomotives to ever run on the North British Railway. They were designed by William P. Reed, who was the locomotive superintendent for NBR. Designed to be big, grand, and impressive, they were that, but there was some issue when it came to actually utilizing them. The design ethos initially was very overly ambitious, including advertising them, and even though they were rapidly built, they still actually wouldn't be ready for the timetables they had been designed to serve on. They would also found that they were too big for the turntables that were owned by NBR, which is a problem that actually I have seen come up more than once, with a railway, and how hard is it to measure the length of a locomotive before you finish it and check to see if the turntables, which currently exist at the time of construction, are long enough to accommodate it. Like, how is that an oversight? It's just ludicrous to me that it's happened more than once on more than one railway. Anyway, this caused serious operating difficulties initially for these locomotives, for obvious reasons, until the turntables could be enlarged. 
There was also a lot of opposition to the use of the engines, particularly from a man named James Bell, who was NBR's civil engineer. He was responsible for the permanent way, the tracks, and he felt that these engines were so heavy and so powerful that they would cause damage to them. Now, that's debatable, but this criticism plus the other mismanagement actually caused the locomotives to suffer significantly when it came to their initial performance. There was poor communication between the locomotive department and the traffic department regarding where and when the locomotives should be used, or even really what they were for. It took some time for them to really fill a niche, but they eventually did, because fundamentally, from a core design perspective, they were actually very good. Once they figured out the turntable problem, and figured out when you're supposed to use these incredibly powerful locomotives, they ran extremely well for many years, until the 1930s. That's when they were slowly withdrawn from service and scrapped. However, there was one that was meant to be preserved, the Midlothian. She was the last one to be withdrawn in December of 1937. It was ordered that she be preserved for the nation as a piece of history, but she was already in the process of being scrapped when that order was received. Weirdly, they put her back together as her parts were all still intact, so they rebuilt her and then returned her to service to be transferred to the London and North Eastern Railway Museum at York. Now that sounds like a good thing, and you might think maybe she's still there. She is not. See, it was just a few months after this that the Second World War commenced, and there was a massive demand for metal to produce aircraft. As a result, the newly rebuilt Midlothian was scrapped again. She was withdrawn from the museum stock, and her metal components were used to build new aircraft to fight World War II. As a result, not a single one of the H-Class survived into preservation. The London Midland and Scottish Railway Jubilee Class, sometimes called Red Staniers, or just Jubes, they were designed by William Stanier, who made the incredible Black Fives, as you may know, and they were actually built concurrently with them, but the Black Fives kind of wound up overshadowing the Jubilees in many ways. They had some serious issues early on. The first members of the class, the original 113, were found to be disappointing by the crews that operated on them. They were poor steamers, and the older locomotives that they would be replacing actually performed better than they did. What was the issue? Well, it was the blast pipe. It was too large for the engines to make proper steam. When this problem was figured out, though, it was fixed, as well as some other minor modifications. The changes actually completely reinvented the Jubilees. Suddenly, they became sensational, just as good as the Black Fives in some ways, even though they weren't as prevalent. A total of 191 would be produced, and the last one wouldn't be withdrawn until the 4th of November, 1967. They were actually the last express engines from the Big Four days, prior to British Railways, that were still in service at that time. Unfortunately, four of them did wind up in preservation in various places. Cahapur, Bahamas, Leander, and Sierra Leone are all in preservation. The latter two are at Carnforth MPD. Bahamas is at Cayley and Worth Valley Railway, and Kolapur is at Tissily Locomotive Works. I think these engines are actually quite beautiful in many ways. They were known as red staniers as they were often painted a nice crimson color and I really like the look of them. They look a little like Black Fives, but somehow more elegant to me. So if you ever get the chance to see one, I would say it's worth it. I would love to, personally. The Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway Class 8. These were a total of 20 460 10-wheelers, as we call them in the US, express passenger locomotives that were designed by George Hughes in 1908. They were ambitious in some ways, and for ten-wheelers they were actually very large. They were nicknamed Dreadnoughts, referring to their size, and after the then new Royal Navy battleship HMS Dreadnought. However, these locomotives were not actually very successful, at least initially. They were found to be actually completely awful in almost every conceivable way. They were sluggish, poor runners, and poor steamers and the advent of World War I severely hindered redesign efforts because they just didn't have the means to rebuild the engines back then. They gave them light modifications to try to help them out, but it wasn't much. It wasn't until 1919 that 15 of them would be rebuilt, 
with superheaters, piston valves, as well as Warshark's valve gear. The rebuild did a complete 180 with their design. Like, they became the opposite of what they were, because they were very bad. And now the crew suddenly found them to be a good workmanlike engine, and an engine thoroughly master of its work. They were good, genuinely so. They worked extremely well. Their only major flaw was that they did have a heavy level of coal consumption, but outside of that, they were considered quite exceptional. But of course, nothing lasts forever, and eventually they were withdrawn between 1934 and 1951, and not a single one of them was preserved. They were all scrapped. The Lake Superior and Ishpeming Railroad, Class SC-4. These were 280 consolidation type steam locomotives that were originally built by the American Locomotive Company, ALCO, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, for Lake Superior and Ishpeming Railroad, all the way back in 1910. On the surface, they seemed like they should have been fine. The consolidation type was proven, they had decent size and tractive effort. What was the problem? The railroad expected great power from these little engines and figured they could pull heavy passenger trains and iron ore trains. Except that none of them worked very well. They had smaller boilers than the Class B4s, and as a result, they weren't quite as powerful as them. They were only capable of about 34,000 pounds of tractive effort. And this wasn't even mentioning other design flaws, such as that their fireboxes were very narrow. They were tucked in between the rear set of driving wheels. This made them really poor steamers, even compared to the 060s they had been meant to replace. They also had a habit of stalling, whether it be on hills or even on flat bits of track when the trains were just too heavy for them. And the crews hated them for it. It was such a pain in the butt. The railroad had to redesignate their jobs to motive power just for mixed trains that were lighter, as helper engines for heavy ore trains, or even just as dock switchers. Definitely not the kind of work they were supposed to be doing. There were other railways that used the class too, and they had similar issues. LS and I wound up with more of these engines when they purchased the Musening, Marquette, and Southeastern Railway. And that's actually when they started officially calling them the SC4s, as they had to reclassify them to differentiate them from the new ones they just got. The railroad had also had enough of their issues and wanted to get some further use out of the locomotives. So between 1928 and 1934, the engines, with the exception of number 25 for some reason, were completely rebuilt, given multiple modifications to fix their problems. The result was that many of their problems were just gone. The rebuilds were a complete success. They did extremely well, and they lasted an incredible amount of time, all things considered. Number 18, one of the most famous preserved steam locomotives of the class, wasn't retired till 1962. And as I just mentioned, this class did see some preservation, in fact, number 18 has had just so many owners that I could make an entire video about her story. She's been close to scrapping a handful of times, but always managed to dodge it, and now she's based in Pottstown, Pennsylvania. She's currently undergoing a rebuild and restoration, and while there isn't a solid date on when exactly she'll be returned to Steam, they do intend to do that exact thing with her. And that's a win in my book. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Some Dude 267, Orange Glass, Joshua Long, Ohio Trucker 1, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hoth 444, Arthur Roy, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsune 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Tribal Typhoon, Master of None, Josh Johnson, Lock Kraken, Twin Fox, Dimeblade 17, and Anzac A1. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.